victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he came with my on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his growing, of his precious ones atoning, and I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He saw me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory. Beneath the cleansing flood, I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried to Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and found me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the street of gold lay on the crystal sea. About the angel singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and fought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Good evening. I want to welcome everyone to our midweek Bible study. If you're visiting with us, we're happy you came our way and want to invite you back at every opportunity that you have. There are several added to our... Uh, this week to our prayer list that's in the bulletin board and also in a, a bulletin. And uh, also we want to add uh, Mary Hankins, the procedure went well, and Tammy's mother, and she'll be coming home Friday. Remember her in her prayers. Also, Henry Murray is not doing well. He's back in the hospital. And uh, under sympathy, Andrea Tyndall's grandmother, Lucy Myers, uh, let's remember her family. She was Andrea Tyndall's grandmother, and the visitation is at 10 to 11 at the Harrison Funeral Home in Naples, Texas. The funeral is tomorrow at 11 a.m. Under news, uh, December 2020 calendars are in the foyer, and anyone who would like to contribute to the Disaster Relief Fund, please get the funds today or bring to the office. Uh, we've been in contact with them, and money is the most pressing thing. They they have most other goods on hand, so money is the most important thing right now that they can use. So if you would like to contribute to that, we'll see Dave or bring it to the office. 
I believe that's about all I have. Will you bow with me, please, for a word of prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we have this opportunity to come during the middle of the week and study thy word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with the teachers that bring our lessons. We pray that they'll have a ready remembrance of thy word, and we pray that we as listeners might remember the things that are being taught so that we might better prepare ourselves to spread the gospel in this community and throughout the world. Heavenly Father, we ask thee now to be with those that were mentioned as being sick, and we pray that you'll be with them and be with the doctors tending to them, and we pray that their health may be restored and be back with us soon. We ask thee to go with us the remainder of this service, bring us back at our next appointed time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The invitation song is 922. 922 is the invitation song. All right, well, tonight in our adult Bible class, we're going to be looking at Jacob, the man who had power with God. Although early on in his life, he didn't have a lot of power with God. In fact, he was a pretty notorious individual, according to the Bible record. His name means supplanter, and he sought to live out that name within his life very early on. First of all, by taking away the uh, birthright from Esau, and then secondly, by taking away the father's blessing from Esau. And both of those things he did in a somewhat shady manner. And shady might be using a rather polite term <laughs> for what he did. But later on in his life, Jacob encountered his father soon-to-be father-in-law, Laban, or his uncle Laban. And he learned a thing or two about being supplanted because Laban himself had some supplanting to do of Jacob. When Jacob was ready to leave after his nearly 21 years of service in Laban's employ, he found himself between a rock and a hard place. He... Didn't, couldn't go back to Laban's house and going forward meant that he had to confront Esau. And what did Jacob do at that time? He got down on his knees and he prayed to the Lord. The Lord heard his prayer and that night an angel of the Lord came and wrestled with Jacob, touched his thigh and made him limp in his hip. But the angel he would not let go of the angel until he got a blessing. And the blessing was the changing of his name from Jacob to Israel, which some have interpreted to mean a prince or some have interpreted to mean power with God. It means that if we want to be a prince with God or have power with God, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord as well. As we look through the scriptures, we see that humility is the true way for us to have a proper relationship with God. Thinking about what David wrote in Psalm 51 when he confessed his sin to the Lord. And then he said this, A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. God respects those who humble themselves before them, before him. And the reason is because they understand their relationship with reality. They understand their relationship with reality. You know, mankind has a pride problem. Pride tends to lift us up and to make us think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. This is what Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. And if we continue on with a prideful attitude within our life, it won't be long before we will be cut down by someone or something or some situation that comes along in life. And if we don't understand what to do in those moments, 
then that can be a very difficult ordeal to endure. But with God on our side, we can recognize our failures and understand that through them, he is making us into someone who can be better than we were in the past and more humble and recognizing our place in relationship to the Lord. It's not something that God himself wasn't willing to do because in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, it tells us that Jesus Christ did it. And who was he? The one who counted not of being on an equality with God a thing to be held on to, but he emptied himself. And what form did he take? The form of a servant. He humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that is the path that we must walk as well. Jacob's such an interesting character, and tonight in our Bible class we're going to look at more of the details of his life. But at the end of, the li end of his life, we can see why Jacob was a man of faith. Because ultimately, he put his trust in the Lord. And regardless of what comes our way, that's what we need to do too. Put our trust in the Lord. You know, there's so many trials and tribulations and troubles that we have to face in this life. And we try to wrestle with them all by ourselves without the Lord's help. Then we're going to be overcome. But when we put our faith in God and trust him to handle things for us, things go a lot better. And especially when we trust God with our salvation. Because ultimately we are in a position of powerlessness when it comes to that. We are not in the place where we can say, by my own hands I can lift myself up to heaven. No, that's not the case at all. In fact, just the opposite. It's by my own hands that I'm guilty. But God sent Jesus to die on the cross for us, who humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, so that we might have salvation. And that salvation is available tonight to any who would hear the words of Jesus Christ, believe them, repent of their sins, confess him as Lord, and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And in doing that, one may humble himself before God, like Jacob did. And so if someone needs to do that this evening, we're ready to help you. Or maybe you need the prayers of the church and you would like to come this evening and ask for those prayers. Now is a good time to do that. Whatever your need may be, you can come now and make it known while we stand and while we sing. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy all and all. Jesus prayed it all. Oh, to him my all. Sin had left a crimson stain. It washed in white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete. I'll lay my trophies down, all down at Jesus' feet. Jesus paid it all, oh, to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, it washed it white as snow.
All right, well, good evening. Glad to have you here tonight for Bible class. We are looking at our book. And by the way, if anyone needs one of these little books, we have plenty in the office, and you are welcome to get one. We're on page 17 here, Studies in Bible Characters, Jacob, the Man Who Had Power with God. And so we have plenty of these books. They're available for anyone who would like to have one. And if you are at home and you'd like to have one of these books, then please go ahead and let us know and we'll get one to you somehow. We can put it in the mail to you or we can drop it by the house if that's more convenient, whatever we need to do. So, but we have plenty of books, plenty of books. All right, so tonight we're looking at Jacob. And I mentioned a little bit about Jacob in our devotional thought and just kind of briefly touched on the highlights but we're going to look at him in a little bit more detail here. And the memory verse that we're looking at here, Genesis chapter 32 and verse 28, uh, specifically in the King James Version, different versions have different in, uh, ways of translating this verse. But the King James Version translates the verse, and he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. Power with God and with men. I'm kind of keying off of that thought. Power with God is what we're thinking about. And so other translations translate a little different way. Um, some say you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Um, but um, the idea is that his name was Israel, and Israel either means prince of God or power with God or, or something like that. And so the, the question that I want to ask tonight is this. How do you win a wrestling match with God? <laughs> right? Think about that for a minute as we think about Jacob's life, because that's basically what was going on here. A wrestling match with God. How do you win a wrestling match with God? No, I don't think it was a dream. I think it was a real thing. I don't, I don't know that that's the case. Yes, Genesis 32. I don't think he was sleeping. Uh, verse 24 says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. So, yeah, so it was at night. Yeah, it was at night. Uh, but I, I don't think he was sleeping. I just, this was just a uh, an occurrence, something that happened here. So, but you know, after he woke up, he had, or... Now you got me thinking that way. <laughs> I know, but he, he, I don't think he was asleep. Um, after he wrestled, he had the hip problem. So if it was just a dream, then how, how is it that he had a hip problem? So I don't think it was just a dream, but that's a good question. Um, but anyway, let's back up a little bit and look at our introduction in our first paragraph here. Have you ever felt powerless? Have you ever felt powerless? Or just, you know, you feel like, man, I have nothing that I can do right now. I just feel so powerless or maybe alone or in a difficult circumstance or situation and you didn't know what to do. Or maybe you've been depressed. Or maybe you are caught between a rock and a hard place and you don't know which way to go. Well, there's different solutions that have been suggested for that kind of circumstance. But what the Bible is telling us is that sometimes those feelings <clears throat> are a symptom of deeper spiritual problems that maybe we're not willing to face. Maybe we're not willing to own up to the life that we've created. Or maybe we're not willing to take ownership 
of the moment that we are in. And Jacob had a difficult moment in Genesis chapter 32. And we'll get to that in, in a little bit. But Jacob, you know, I like Jacob a lot as a Bible character because he's very human. He's, he has so many faults, so many problems. And yet, at the same time, he never gives up. He keeps trying, and he keeps going forward. He is someone who ultimately discovers that he needs to trust God more, and he does eventually. And so I think as we study through his story, you're going to find a very you're going to find his story very inspirational. I, I find it very inspirational for me. All right, well, let's start at the beginning. Jacob was the son, one of the sons, of Isaac and Rebekah. And Isaac, you know, you remember Isaac, right? He's the son of Abraham and Sarai. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? If you learned in Bible class when you are little, the three wandering Jews, right? <laughs> Once there were three wandering Jews. You remember that song? Anybody? Some of you do. Some of you looking at me like I'm crazy. Okay. Um, it's all right. I probably am. But uh, so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? So Isaac is the child of promise. And Isaac marries uh, Rebekah. And Rebekah, uh, then it has twins. She has Jacob and Esau. And going back to Genesis chapter 25, we see that when these two uh, boys are born, that there is a prophecy associated with them. In fact, uh, Genesis chapter 25 and verse 23, look at what it says here. And the Lord said to her, that is to Rebekah, um, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, there's a very specific prophecy. The older shall serve the younger. Now, if uh, you were given a prophecy like that, and you knew that one of your children, or that both of your children was prophesied by the Lord, that the older would serve the younger, what do you think you would do with that information? As a mother, maybe we should ask our mothers in this audience. You know, what do you think you would do with that information? The older shall serve the younger. How would you treat those boys? No, no ideas. <laughs> Do you think you would say, well, if the older is going to serve the younger, then I better get with it, you know, and start making the older serve the younger? Or what do you think? Is that something you might try to do? Well, you lead them in the right direction, one thing. Well, that's true, I guess. Of course, hindsight's 2020. We're looking back on this with hindsight, right? But we're not in Rebecca's shoes exactly, right? We don't, we don't have a prophecy about two children, and we kind of know what the outcome of the story is, but it seems that Rebecca tries to make the prophecy come true in some ways. And maybe even uh, Jacob is trying to make the prophecy come true in some ways as well. It might explain some of his behavior. Um, so we know that Rebecca knows about this prof prophecy. Did she share that information with Jacob when he was uh, a boy? I don't know. Maybe she did. Maybe she didn't. We don't know exactly. But we do know that what happens next in the story of Jacob and Esau is that they're, they're grown up here in Genesis chapter 25, verses 29 through 34. And um, Jacob's cooking a stew, it says there in verse 29. And Esau is a, a wood, woodsman. He's a hunter. He likes to go out into the woods and spend, you know, days and days hunting and gathering and uh, bringing back game for his parents to eat and him to eat. And he comes back this time empty-handed. 
But he's been out there for a while, evidently, and he's kind of hungry. And so he says to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. Verse 31 says, now you got to understand a little bit about what the, diff what the birthright meant to understand what Jacob is getting at here. A birthright was more or less the right of inheritance to the family. In the book of Genesis, the person who receives the birthright gets a double portion of inheritance, okay? And so they get more than the other children. And there was two ways to get that inheritance. You either got it from being the firstborn or you got it from being blessed. And this is the research that I've done on this. This seems what is going on here. And you get to Joseph's life, for example, and Jacob blesses Joseph with a double portion because Joseph's children, Ephraim and Manasseh, become each become a tribe. And so... Joseph gets a double portion by virtue of Ephraim and Manasseh, all right? And so you don't have a tribe of Joseph, even though Joseph was one of the 12 sons of Israel, right? You have Ephraim and Manasseh. And so, and that's because Joseph got a double blessing, okay? But Joseph was not the firstborn. So how did he get that? Well, when you have a situation where the firstborn is the one who has the birthright, that means that he, is, he stands to inherit that double blessing or that double inheritance as long as he doesn't do something really completely foolish. Like, for example, um, Reuben, was it Reuben was the firstborn of Jacob or yeah Reuben Reuben did something foolish and that's why uh, he or was it Judah Reuben okay yeah Reuben Simeon Levi Judah Zebulun okay so and so he didn't get the inheritance because he messed it up well Esau is kind of like that as well here Jacob says sell me your birthright and so Esau says, look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? And so he said, swear to me of this day. So he swore to him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. So Esau despised his birthright, verse 34 says there, okay? Now, he didn't have to do that, but he did. Jacob took advantage of him, of his situation, of his circumstances. He didn't really show a brother's love, you know. If he'd have loved his brother, he would have just given him the food that he was needing for hungry. Because what? If somebody's hungry, we're supposed to feed them, right? Not hold it over their head and say, okay, what are you going to give me for this? You know? So that's the kind of person Jacob is showing himself to be here. He's taking advantage of Esau. He's, as the name Jacob means, supplanter, he's supplanting Esau, right? He's trying to take his place in the scheme of things because Esau is the firstborn and Jacob was born after Esau. But, but the prophecy says the elder shall serve the younger. Well, the next story we get about uh, Jacob and Esau here has to do with the blessing. Now, if, for example, the birthright was lost somehow, it could be regained through the father's blessing. So if the father decided that, you know, somehow the birthright gets lost, but he still wants the oldest son to uh, inherit the, the double portion, then he can give him a blessing. And that blessing kind of overrides the birthright. And that's what Jacob does with his 12 sons. Uh, there's one that has the birthright, but he overrides that birthright with 
the blessing that he gives to Joseph. And then Joseph is the one who gets the double portion. And so Isaac is preparing to override the fact that Jacob now holds the birthright. And evidently, Isaac doesn't like Jacob very much. Um, you know, Jacob is Rebekah's favorite, but Esau is Isaac's favorite, it seems like. So now there comes a time when Isaac thinks he's going to die. And so he's going to pass on the blessing to one of his sons, and he chooses Esau. He's going to pass the blessing on to Esau. Well, Rebekah gets wind of that and decides that um, she's going to make a change, that that's not going to take place. And so what does she do? She dresses up Jacob in the garb of Esau and makes him feel like Esau, his arms feel like Esau's arms. He makes him, makes him uh, bring the food that Esau brings to uh, Isaac to eat that Isaac had requested of him. And when Isaac is older and he can't really see very well, and so he, he feels and he says, you feel a lot like Esau, but your voice sounds like Jacob, you know. <laughs> but anyway, but he went ahead and gave Jacob the blessing anyway. And then afterward, Esau comes in and he says, what did you do? He said, well, it's too late. I've already given Jacob the blessing. And now Esau is very upset. He's very upset. And in fact, he's so upset that he is going to threaten his brother. Genesis chapter 27 and verse 41. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand then I will kill my brother, Jacob. So he, his, in his mind, he's going to kill Jacob because of this. Yes. Well, the prophecy would have still come true that it just happened in some other way. And since we don't have a different story, I guess we never, we'll never know. <laughs> but yeah, that's what, this is what happened. So, um, but God, God, of course, knows everything that's going to happen. He even knows the possibilities. He even knew what the plan would be if, if uh, Rebecca hadn't acted this way. So, you know, but anyway, what we have in the Bible is what, what happened. Uh, so that's, that's how it came about. All right, so Esau is very upset. He's angry with Jacob. He threatens to kill him. And so Rebekah goes to Jacob and she says, you know what? Maybe it would be best for you to kind of get out of town for a while and let Esau kind of cool down a little bit, right? And so flee to my brother Laban in Haran, verse 43 says, in Genesis chapter 27. So that's where Jacob goes. He, he goes to Laban's house. And while he's at Laban, when he first gets to Laban's house, who does he see? He sees Rachel. And immediately he's smitten. And he wants to marry this girl, you know, real quick. And he goes to Laban and he says, what will it take? And Laban says, well, if you'll serve me for seven years, you can have Rachel's hand in marriage. And Jacob says, that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. I'll go ahead and do that. And so he served him for seven years. And the time came for Jacob and Rachel's wedding. 
And they made all the preparations and had the big show and everything. And uh, they set up the tent, you know, where the marriage would be consummated. And Jacob goes into the tent thinking that Rachel's in there. And he wakes up the next morning and lo and behold, it's Rachel's sister, Leah. Now, how would you like to have something like that pulled on you? <laughs> I don't think I'd be too happy myself. I think I'd be a mite disappointed, you know, that things worked out like that. And I think Jacob was disappointed that things worked out like that. And so he goes to complain to Laban, and Laban says, wait a minute now. Hold your horses there, son. It's all good. You can have Leah too. And that probably wasn't what he was thinking, but that's the deal that he got. And so for another seven years, you can go ahead and keep this girl also. And so Jacob says, well, looks like my hands are tied. I'll go ahead and serve the other seven years. And so he does. And they uh, then he is then married to Rachel and to Leah at this point. And so um, this other seven years goes by pretty quick as well. And after that point, um, Jacob says, I need a little livestock. Let's make a deal, Laban. And so Laban says, all right, we'll make a deal. He says, J Jacob says, for all the, I'll take all the speckled and spotted livestock and you take all the ones that are solid colors. And evidently the speckled livestock are recessive. All right. From what we can tell from the way things work out, uh, they're recessive. And that means that most of the time you're going to get solid color livestock when solid co color livestock is breeding with solid color livestock. Now, Cassie, can you help me on that? Or is that right? Or more or less? <laughs> We're talking about breeding livestock. Are they solid color livestock breeding with speckled livestock going to give you solid color or depends on the breed. All right. Well, evidently can't depend on that either. All right. Well, in this circumstance, in this situation, evidently Laban thought that he was going to get the better end of the deal. But uh, Jacob uh, was able to uh, do something, and it's not exactly clear what he did, but he took some sticks and he cut notches out of these sticks and he put it in the watering trough. And the best I can understand, it's this is either a miracle or it's a trick of the sight that would make the solid color livestock breed with the speckled livestock or something like that. I don't know. But the bottom line is this, that there became more speckled livestock than there were solid colored livestock. And Jacob ended up, his herds ended up increasing and Laban's herds ended up decreasing. Now, I don't know all the science behind all of that, but uh, that's what happened. And so Jacob figures out that, you know, his... Uh, work with Laban is going pretty well. And he's, he's served now for 20 something years and he's ready to move on. And so he, he's actually living quite a ways away from Laban at this point. And he tells his wives and his children, and all his family, and he said, and all of his servants, he says, we're going to pack up. We're going to go back to the land of Canaan and we're going to live there because that's where God wants us to live. And so they packed up and they set out. Well, word got back to Laban that this was happening, and Laban wasn't too happy about it. In fact, when he finally caught up to um, Jacob, it says in Genesis 31, verse 22, that Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled and then he took his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days journey and overtook him in the mountains 
of Gilead. And Laban was very upset about this. And Jacob was upset about this. They were both pretty hot, all right? In fact, it says here in verse 36 of chapter uh, 31 that Jacob was angry and he rebuked Laban. And he said, you know, what is my trespass? What is my sin that you're coming after me like this with your men of war and that you're going to take, you know, these things from me? What did I do wrong to you? We, I worked 20 years, he said. Verse 38 says, for all these things. And I haven't treated you wrong. I've abided by our agreements. I've done everything you've wanted me to do. And I served you 14 years for your two daughters, verse 41, and six years for your flock. And you've changed my wages 10 times. <laughs> How'd you like to work for an employer like, like that, huh? Change your wages 10 times. You probably say, well, it wouldn't be so bad if it was going up. But I don't think that's the way Laban thought, you know. I don't think that's what he think he was trying not to give Jacob good things. And notice verse 42, unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. And what had happened the previous night was that Laban was coming in with his fighting men and he was going to take back all of that stuff and probably going to, going to kill Jacob. But God appeared to Laban and God told Laban, don't you lay a hand on him. And so Laban decided that he better not do that. But look at Laban's attitude here in verse 43. And Laban answered and said to Jacob, these daughters are my daughters and these children are my children. And this flock is my flock. All that you see is mine. <laughs> so he didn't take too kindly to the agreement that he had made with Jacob. But now God had made it so that, well, there wasn't anything he could do about it. And so they made a heap. Verse 46 says, they gathered stones and they put them in a heap there and they called it, uh, by this name here in verse 47, this, and Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Um, and so the point of this heap was verse 52. I will not pass beyond this heap to you and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. In other words, Jacob, you're no longer welcome on this other side of the heap. And that's the way it's gonna be. And so they made an agreement there. Now Jacob is in a difficult spot. So he can't go back now. He can't go back till if things don't work out in Canaan, there's no going back. So now Jacob goes on his way to Canaan and um, he understands that Esau is still living there. And the last time Jacob had seen Esau, 20 years ago, mind you, the last time he had seen Esau, what, went, what was going through Esau's mind? I'm going to kill him. That's what Esau was thinking. I'm going to kill him. And so what is Jacob thinking? Esau's going to kill me. All right? So, so Jacob sends messengers to Esau, verse 3 of chapter 32 here. And he says to the messengers, speak thus to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. And so the messengers went and they came back and all the only message they gave was this. Esau's coming to see you. <laughs> That's it. That's the only message they brought back. And he has 400 men with him. Well, Jacob doesn't have nearly that much of a fighting force. 
And so he was greatly afraid and distressed, verse 7 says. And he divided the people that were with him in the flocks and the herds, and he put them in a position of defense, a defensive type position. And he said, if Esau comes to attack, then the one company can escape while the other company, well, just be too bad for them. But that's not the only thing Jacob did. He got down on his knees and he uttered this prayer to the Lord in verse 9. O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I've become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. So there's the prayer of Jacob. He humbles himself before God. And that night, after he divides up his companies, um, that night, verse 22 says, and he arose that night and took his two wives and his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. So Jabbok's a river, and he's crossing to the other side of the Jabbok River for a little extra protection for him and his immediate family members. But then it says in verse 24, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. The man is identified a little later on as an angel, and the angel is identified a little later on as God. So this is no mere man. This is no mere angel. This is God who is wrestling with Jacob. Okay? And verse 30 says, For I've seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So how do you win a wrestling match with God? That's the question. Does anybody have an answer? That's it. There's only one way to win a wrestling match with God. And that's if God lets you win. <laughs> but Jacob won this wrestling match with God. You see, Jacob had been wrestling with God his whole life. He had wrestled with God, with God's prophecy about his life and well, what am I supposed to do with this? And so he thought, well, I've got to make it happen myself. And so I'll take away Esau's birthright. Did God tell him to do that? No. And I'll conspire with my mother to lie to my father and get the blessing. Did God tell him to do that? No. And I'll run off and try to make my way in the world. Did God want him to do that? Probably not. But God blessed him in his troubles while he was at Laban's house. And at Laban's house, Jacob, the supplanter, learned what it meant to be supplanted himself. And that's how we learn humility, isn't it? When we take advantage of other people wrongly, when we do things that we shouldn't, when we uh, act in a way that's not becoming and try to get ahead of someone else, we're acting like Jacob the supplanter. But then those things have a way of coming back to bite us, right? And we end up being supplanted ourselves. And God is trying to teach us a lesson, the lesson of humility. And that's the lesson that he was trying to teach Jacob all along. Jacob didn't have a lot of humility when he was living back in Canaan with his brother and his mother and his father. And you can see that from the way he lived his life. But after he comes back from Laban's house, he can't go back to Laban, and now Esau's in front of him, and what's he going to do? He can't fight him because he doesn't have the manpower. There's only one thing to do. Humble yourself before God and let God save you. So that's what he does. 
And so he wrestles with God. He's been wrestling with God all of his life, and now he wrestles with God directly here. And God touches the socket of his hip and his joints out of, out, out of socket, it says. And he said, let me go. The, the one he is wrestling with said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. The way to win a wrestling match with God is to humble yourself before God. And God will then bless you. So Jacob recognized what happened. The next day he confronts Esau. And thankfully, Esau is happy to see him. And he embraces him. And they are then able to be reconciled to one another. All right. So... Let's think about application now for a few moments. Um, James chapter 4 and verse 10 is a key verse in thinking about humility. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's what Jacob needed to learn the whole time, is how to humble himself before God, and that God would be the one who would lift him up. You know, a lot of times... We approach life in the same way. You know, I, I've got to get this done. I've got to get that done. I've got to be this person. I've got to be that person and, and be the kind of person that God wants me to be, you know, and fulfill everything that God has said I need to be doing in my life. And we get in there and we start doing those things and we find out that maybe, maybe that's not what God wanted us to do. And we make a big mess of things like Jacob did. Well, there's another way to live. And that's to humble yourself before God and let God decide how things are going to go in life instead of us. You know, God knows so much more than we do. And we've got to put our faith and trust in him if we want him to save us. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, God is talking to the nation of Israel there and he, he's, he's saying that you don't think uh, your thoughts are not my thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. And his point there is this. Not that his thoughts are so much greater than Israel's thoughts, but that Israel had not made their thoughts God's thoughts. That's what his point is. And so he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heaven are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, God's thoughts are right and Israel's thoughts were wrong. And Israel needed to make their thoughts God's thoughts. And in doing that, they would be right with God. But that requires humility before God. It requires submission to God and to his word. Well, God doesn't want us to do his will, quote unquote, through our own methods, trying to do things in a way that would bring about, uh, you know, a sinful situation or something like that. And we've got to be patient and wait on the Lord a lot of times. We've got to overcome evil with good, Romans chapter 12 and verse 21 says. Today, God's power is in his gospel. And that's the message that God wants us to talk to others about in the world today. Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Today, we don't wrestle directly with God like Jacob did, you know. And God's not going to come down to us and touch our hip or something like that. And he's certainly not going to change our name like he did with Jacob. But he does change our name in a way because when we obey the gospel, we get a new name. The name of Jesus Christ. And that's the name that we should want to have in our life now. 
But to obey the gospel means we've got to submit ourselves to the word of God. Sometimes we feel lonely and powerless and depressed and we try to do things our own way to get ourselves out of the hole. But we keep digging the hole deeper like Jacob did. Well, if we'll humble ourselves before God instead of digging the hole, get down on our knees and pray, then the Lord can find a way out for us. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. God took Jacob's fear and he turned it into peace, didn't he? Jacob was a man who was between a rock and a hard place. And what did he do? He got down on his knees and he prayed. And he let God work out the salvation for him. And God was able to do it, you see, because not only had God been working with Jacob while he was in Laban's house, God had been working with Esau too. Now think about that. Because what was Esau's attitude when Jacob left? I hate you and I'm going to kill you. But when he came back, he was a different person. Esau had learned some things as well, hadn't he? And that's a good thing. And because... We're always learning and growing and changing throughout our lives. That means the future doesn't have to be like the past. It can be very different. All right, well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for being in Bible class tonight. Next week, we're going to take a look at Joseph, God's instrument to save Israel. And Joseph's got a great story as well. So make your plans to be back with us next Wednesday night. And we'll look at Joseph. Thank you so much and God bless you.